the silver trumpets boker tov we get to speak this morning learn a little bit more about the blowing of the silver trumpets as it relates to uh, numbers chapter 10 which is the latter part of actually the fourth aliyah of parasha meholateka so good morning glad you're here we get, like i said we're gonna be reading about this learning about it gleaning some things looking at the kale humash regarding this um this particular uh, section and reading some insights here from Rabbeinu Bakya about uh, these silver trumpets and what they were used for and uh, how they are applied, you know, in scriptural texts. And of course, a little bit of insight into what we can glean from that. And we're going to get into a little bit of halakha as well as it relates to, um, <clears throat> you know, the use of instruments and so forth. So glad you're here. Shalom Alechem. Welcome to the P Judaism. Welcome home to all of you who are new and finding your way here. Uh, we are a uh, a Torah true Judaism, an actual Judaism. We practice Judaism and and thankfully and proudfully so. And so we're glad you're part of it. Please be sure and like this video and share it with all of your friends, of course. And um, uh, also... Please be sure and subscribe to our channel and make sure you do that. Click the little bell icon so that you can keep up to date on everything uh, that goes on. And so I hope you're doing good this morning and I'm doing good. It's been a good week. Looking forward to uh, prep day tomorrow and so on and so forth. So let's dive right into uh, the KL2 Mosh. Again, this is more like the amplified version of, uh, of the read. And it's talking about here about these special and unique trumpets. So it says some, this begins in, in chapter 10, <clears throat> sometime prior to the first journey, God spoke to Moses saying, make yourself two silver trumpets since you are the people's king and it befits a king to summon and command the people with trumpet blast. So that's something right there that, uh, is not, I don't think, readily known or generally understood. And that is that Moses was a king and he was also considered a priest in, uh, in the wilderness in this, in this time frame. And so that's an important point. Remember, it was, it was, it was uh, Cohen, or, excuse me, the Aaron was the Cohen. However, the one who anointed Aaron to be the Cohen was Moshe. And so it, it, so the common commentators bring down that Moshe was, in fact, a priest, and he was also simultaneously a king. And so here we have Moshe, who is the type and shadow of the Messiah, who is both king and priest. Now, in this sense, and, and, and there's kind of a... Um, there's kind of a mirror effect here as well, because in this in this case, Moses is born of Levi, right? The priests come from the tribe of Levi, as do the Levites, of course. So he's born of the tribe of Levi, but yet he has kingship. Mo, or excuse, Yeshua, rather, was born of the line of the tribe of Judah, right? Of the line of David. And therefore, he was born a king, but then he acquired the priesthood. He acquired the priesthood when Yochanan the Immerser uh, immersed Yeshua in the Jordan River. The whole reason why Yeshua was 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 uh, baptized, you know, immersed in the Jordan by Yochanan, was in order that Yeshua should receive the anointing of the priesthood. It should be given to him as it were, spiritually, of course. <clears throat> Just like, and, and, there, and as a result, Yeshua became a king and a priest. Just like uh, Moshe became a king and a priest. And therefore, spiritually, we are kings and priests because, you know, he's king and priest. And, and he became king and priest, you know, in fulfillment of Psalm 110, of course. Now, um, there's precedent for this. I should also add to this conversation that Abraham was also a king and a priest. And the sages bring down that he received his priesthood 
when he was blessed by Melchizedek, Melchizedek was actually Shem, the son of Noah. Melchizedek is a title, not a name. And so he is understood and identified in ancient literature as being Shem. And so when Melchizedek blessed Abraham, the sages say that Abraham received at that moment the priesthood of Melchizedek. And the reason is because Melchizedek's sons were not worthy. They were, they were corrupt. They weren't worthy to receive the priesthood. In the same way that Yochanan, you know, Yeshua received the priesthood because at that time the priesthood was corrupt. Yochanan, um, the immerser, was himself a Kohen. And some some people don't know that, and maybe you knew that already, maybe you didn't. But but uh, Yochanan the immerser was in fact a Cohen. Both of his parents were from uh, from the line of Aaron. <clears throat> now, a little bit of history too. Back in the first century, uh, in the first century time frame when all this is going on, uh, Israel politically, theologically. It's kind of a kind of a, a big uh, a, a lot of things going on, okay. But there were really only there were really only four groups of Jews overarching. When, when I, within these groups, there were various um, sects, or you could say denominations. But essentially, there were four groups. Okay, just to, to, to mention this right quick, the four groups were the Sadducees. The Pharisees, the Zealots, and the Essenes. Those those are essentially the four groups of of Jews, and um, there really weren't any other groups necessarily, right? <clears throat> and as I said, within those groups, there are you know, uh, particularly within the Pharisees and, and and the Zealots and so forth, there were various sects and so forth, but. The, the Sadducees were the priests, predominantly, and they were essentially Roman sellouts, Roman lackeys. They were wealthy people, uh, much like, uh, unfortunately, politicians of our present age. They, they got fat and happy off of uh, maintaining the status quo. They were involved in the temple. The temple was big, big business back then, big business. It was a, you know, a huge uh uh, you know, institution, and they they just uh, enjoyed you know Greek Greco Roman um, culture and just enjoyed you know getting getting paid. And in fact, at that time, the high priest was a Roman appointee, and uh, the Sadducean priests would bid for that job, basically, which was not at all the way the Torah, <laughs> of course. Is said that the high priest is supposed to uh, take uh, take over. So the priesthood basically was corrupted. Is the point I'm trying to get to? The Pharisees, contrary to popular belief, this is why studying of history is so important. Contrary to popular belief, the Pharisees were actually the good guys. Were they perfect? Were they were they were they all perfect? No. Did Yeshua call them out on some of their hypocritical practices? Yeah. Um. But in in general, they were the good guys. These were the Torah true, Torah observant guys, and they were not legalistic. Actually, that is a falsehood. And Josephus even writes about this, that the people love the Pharisees because they were lenient. And I know this comes as a shocker to some people, but the Pharisees were lenient in their application of Torah, and they looked for ways to make Torah life Basically doable, you could say, easy, enjoyable, meaningful. And so <clears throat> they, of course, are the ones who uh, codified and developed, you know, the oral law. The Sadducees didn't, didn't believe in the oral law, but Sadducees didn't believe in anything but the first five books of Moses. They pretty much ignored the, the writings and the, and the prophets as well, they were extremely legalistic. And Josephus brings down that the people hated the Sadducees with a passion because people that tend to be word of God only tend to be rather kind of creepy. I'm just going to say it. Okay. Um, 
And so then you have the zealots. They were just, you know, kill all Romans, kill all Greeks. They're just a militant group. And then you have the Essenes and they were the, uh, they lived out in the Dead Sea area. They were, they lived in a commune. Um, men didn't um, mingle with women at all, ever, ever, ever at all. And they believed that the Messiah was coming in the next few minutes. And they, they had developed this kind of like, you know, well, monastery like existence. Um, <clears throat> and so hence we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. So we know a lot about them, but the reason that Yeshua had so many encounters with the Pharisees is because he was a Pharisee. And so the, the reason they had so many discussions with the Pharisees, some of them got heated, which is not uncommon in Jewish culture to have heated, you know, de debates or whatever. Um, but that's because he was a Pharisee and they're the only ones who cared because if you didn't belong to, you know, uh, first of all, the Sadducees aren't looking for a Messiah. To, quite to the contrary, they don't want one. They, they like the Roman Caesar and, you know, that pays the bills. Uh, the Zealots aren't really looking for a Messiah either. They just want to kill Romans. The Essenes are looking for the Messiah, absolutely, but it's not going to be from the Pharisees because the Essenes and the Pharisees don't really get along because the Essenes believe, again, that's why history is so important, that the Pharisees aren't strict enough. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, the only people are going to, and Pharisees aren't going to look for somebody to be the Messiah if you're not a Pharisee. But if you're not a Pharisee, the Pharisees don't care if you claim to be the Messiah or not. So if you're an Essene or a Zealot or something else, and that you claim to be the Messiah, the, the, the Pharisees are like, whatever, talk to the hand. They don't care. But the reason they're talking to Yeshua and saying, are you the Mashiach? Uh, because he's a Pharisee. All right. All right, so brings us circle circle back because that all started because we're talking about Moses being a king and priest. So I wanted to kind of break that down, the types and shadows we have here of Moses, Moshe being a king and priest, Yeshua being a king and priest, etc., Abraham being a king and priest, and how all that takes place. So it says here, nonetheless, since your kingship over the people will never be matched by any other king, they will have... Only you will use these trumpets, okay? So these trumpets are just for Moses. He's saying that, that no other king is going to match you, Moses, except, 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 of course, for King Messiah. But that's not what's being discussed here. What's being talk, talked about here is, um, uh, you know, the normal kings. <clears throat> and the reason, one of the reasons for that, by the way, is because normally a king is not also a priest. So it says, spend your own money to make them. You must make them out of a block of silver beaten into their form. You must make use of them to summon the congregation when you wish to speak to them and to announce the departure of the divisions. When the priests blow a tekiah, a long blast on both of them, the whole congregation must assemble before you at the entrance of the tent of meeting. If they blow a tekiah on one of them, the prince's leaders in Israel's thousands must convene before you at the entrance of the tent of meeting. When you, the priest, blow a tekiah followed by a teruah and, and another tekiah on the, both trumpets, the divisions encamped to the east must set out. When you, the priest, blow the same signal at the kia followed by a teruah and another tekiah a second time on both trumpets, the divisions encamped to the south must travel. Thus, they must blow a teruah framed by two tekiah blows for beginning their travels. But when assembling the congregation, you must blow a tekiah, but not a teruah. The descendants of Aaron, the priest, must blow the trumpets, even though only you, Moshe, <clears throat> may use these particular two trumpets. This institution of trumpet blowing will be a rule for all time, for all generations, with other trumpets. So the silver trumpets were just for Moshe to use. Okay? This they these other trumpets will be blown for the following purposes. If you go to war in your land against the adversary that attacks you, you must blow a teruah with the trumpets and remember favorably before God, be or be remembered favorably before God, your God, and thus be saved from your enemies. On the journey days, you de designate to celebrate your victory on your uh, on your over your enemies as well as on your festivals and on your new moon celebrations, you must blow on the trumpets over your communal ascent offerings and your peace offerings, and it will be a remembrance before you. So it's talking here, of course, about the fact that these, the silver trumpets were unique to Moses. They were his personal 
trumpets that were only used in the wilderness. When we get into the Holy Land, the priests are supposed to continue to blow trumpets. However, in this case, it's not the silver ones, but rather it's the trumpets of, uh, you know, uh, shofarot and so forth. There's an interesting insight here from um, Rabbeinu Bakya because it says, on the day of your gladness, you shall blow the shofar. This is the reason, um, one of the reasons why we blow the shofar in the synagogue on Shabbat is because of this very verse. We've been doing this, you know, since our inception. Um, you know, well, you know, the, the synagogue aspect of our ministry, pardon me, was officially launched in 2011. So what is what are we on now? Like, what, 12 years? Isn't that crazy? It's been 12 years already. Doesn't it sound like, uh, for those of you who are a little bit more mature, uh, you know, back in the 2000 or 2001 or 2002, 2001, a space odyssey. Uh, anyway, it sounds like, um, I don't know, it sounds so new, <laughs> but but uh, it's already been 23 years ago since it was 2000. YK2, y, y, was it YK, YK2, or what is that? What was that? Where everything was going to end. Messiah was going to come and all the computers were going to shut down. But anyway, <clears throat> I digress. So the reason we, we started blowing the shofar on Shabbat morning was because of this verse. And it's interesting because it says on the day of your gladness, and that day is interpreted to mean the Shabbat. Thank you, Rick. Y2K. How could I forget? So it's on the day of your gladness. At the time of the sacrifices. So the shofar was also blown when the sacrifices were offered up. And there was another insight when it talks about sacrifices that the blowing of the shofar actually was an intrinsic part of offering up that sacrifice. And, and, and there's a, and, and Rabbi, I think it's Rabbi Trugman that talks about this. Uh, and it's also, I believe, also um, Rabbi Monk has the insight as well that, you know, the Levites were on the platform worshiping 24-7. I want you to remember that. They were on the platform worshiping 24 hours a day, seven days a week with their instruments and song. And the insights bring down that the, the music to include the shofar blowing was necessary in, or, in order to make the sacrifice effectual. And I find that's very interesting. It's, there's a spiritual phenomenon, basically, is what it's talking about. But this is what Rabbi uh, Monk says. He says, on the day of your gladness, at the time of the sacrifices, well, the Kohanim sounded the silver trumpets. So it says, which days of gladness are being referred to here? The Sifra says that this means the Shabbat. Thus, overriding in this case, the prohibition against playing music on the Sabbath. Now, I read this insight for, for two reasons. One, I want you to just point out that the day of your gladness is referring to the Shabbat, but I also want to point out that Rabbi Monk is um, a very, very, very intelligent rabbi, very well-versed, and just I love his work. Uh, having said that, you know, no one's perfect. And so he has written here something that is not true. And, but I understand why he wrote it because of the custom. But I wanted to bring it to your attention because you're likely to hear this in the, in the, in the future or you're likely to already have heard it and, and, and wonder about it. He says here that there is a prohibition against playing music on the Sabbath. As a result, by the way, an orth traditional Orthodox synagogues don't have musical instrumentation on the Sabbath. You can sing, you can clap your hands, you can even dance, but you can't play musical instruments. And so there are many people, many Jewish people, evidently, I'm going to assume Rabbi Monk, who believe that that's because there is a prohibition to play musical instruments on the Sabbath. But how many of you just heard me say a second ago that the Levites had a platform in the temple in, on upon which they worshiped God 24 hours a day, seven days a week with song and instruments? How many of you just heard me say that? Right. So let's cut to the chase. There is no such prohibition in Jewish 
halakha and Jewish law. There is no such prohibition. There is no, there's nothing in the Shulchan Aruch and the Yoridea and the Chinuch. There is nothing anywhere that prohibits playing a musical instrument on the Sabbath. It is, in a lot of cases, a myth to suggest that it's prohibited. It's not prohibited. In fact, what the halakha actually says is that playing musical instruments or even listening to music to include singing, in our modern age, that would include music on the radio, listening to a record, um, is actually prohibited. You're not, according to Jewish law, if you actually followed the Shulchan Aruch, then you or I listening, you are you are listening to music in any form is actually forbidden. Now you might be thinking to yourself, what? And I I, I totally understand that. Why would it be forbidden? It wasn't forbidden before, clearly not. Why would it be forbidden now? And the answer is because of the destruction of the temple. This is why during the three weeks, from the 17th of Tammuz to the 9th of Av, we don't listen to music to include, or ex with, with the exception of Shabbat, right? But during the three weeks, we're not allowed to listen to music on the radio, to listen to music uh, on an iPod or, or whatever. We're not allowed to listen. To, we're not even allowed to sing. Because during those three weeks, we are mourning the temple. Now, the original halakha that is actually codified says we're not allowed to listen to music ever. But what, what happened is, is that after a certain period of time, it became apparent that this was not going to work. That halakha was not going to work. Okay. Why? Well, because, you know, you want to have music at your wedding. You want to have music at your uh, your son's bris malah and, and, and other festivals, right? It's kind of, I mean, you just, you can't sit around in silence. You want to be able to sing. You want to be able to cant. You know, canting is singing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam. Right? I mean, that's singing. So what happened? So basically, Judaism kind of did something they're not supposed to do. They kind of ignored the halakha and created a custom that said, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're not, and we're not going to get rid of the halakha in its entirety. But we're going to say, let's not do music on Shabbat, but let's do music during the week. Why? Well, because it's kind of like breaking the glass at the end of a wedding. How many of you know why we break the glass at the end of a wedding? How many of you know? And, and it's and it's kind of uh that that in itself, by the way, has become kind of <laughs> kind of missed, right? Um, because because at the end of a Jewish wedding, you know, the, the couple turns around, the, the rabbi says, uh, maybe, maybe he says, uh, you know, presenting. Mr. and Mrs. Whatever, um, doesn't he doesn't have to say that, but maybe he does. Um, and the 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 groom takes a, a glass, a wine glass, usually something like that, uh, in a in a container and in a in a, a, a pouch, puts it on the ground and he stomps it, and everybody says Mazel Tov, and there's clapping and song, right? Uh, it's a little a little strange. I mean, it, it, it's perfectly fine to do that. Don't get me wrong, okay? But when you actually think about what the glass breaking is all about, and yes, Leah and, uh, and Sleep Talker there are correct. It's about the destruction of the temple. Why? Because the scripture says, If at my highest joy I forget you, O Jerusalem, and the highest joy in Judaism 
is a wedding. That's the highest joy. <clears throat> and so um, we break the glass at the highest joy in order to remember Jerusalem. That's what it's supposed to be. Well, in Jewish thought, Shabbat, every Shabbat is like a wedding. It's the, has, it has the, the joy status of a wedding. So therefore, the Jewish people at some point said, you know what? We will not have musical instruments on Shabbat because it's like a wedding. And therefore, we will remember the temple that we should, we should, we should, uh, at our highest joy, we should remember that there's not a temple. And that will suffice to take care of the halakha. Now, the reason we're going to have musical instruments during the week is because you're not allowed to have weddings on Shabbat. You're not allowed to have anything on Shabbat except Shabbat. So therefore, if we need to have a wedding, we're going to have it during the week. If we have a wedding during the week, we're going to need music. So therefore, we'll have music. And so there you go. People have forgotten that. They don't know why we don't have music on Shabbat. They have come to believe over the centuries that it's because it was prohibited, but in fact, it wasn't. When you actually dig deep and you ask rabbis today, why can't we have music on Shabbat? The answer is never, ever, 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 ever going to be, unless they're just ignorant, which is rare. They're never going to tell you, because usually when you ask a rabbi, he's like, uh, if he doesn't really know for sure, he's going to go look it up. He goes to look it up and goes, golly gee whiz, to uh, to quote Beef Cleaver. Uh, there's, uh, there's no halakha here. What's the reason now? So I've got to go back and say, well, the reason is if you play this musical instruments on Shabbat, this is what you'll hear. If you play a musical instrument on Shabbat, then the instrument may break. And if you break it, then you're going to try to fix it. And if you fix it, now you violated Shabbat. I'm not even making that up. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am a musician. I'm a musician. I am. I play the harmonica. I also uh, play the bass guitar. And, of course, I play the shofar. I have played the bass guitar and the harmonica and the shofar for a very long time. And I have never, ever, ever, ever had them break. You can't really break a harmonica unless you stomp on it. I've never had my shofar break. It's a horn. And my guitar, um, I guess that in theory it could break. I guess you could break a string, maybe. Although on the bass, that's a bit more challenging. Um, but if it broke, you just put it down, I guess. Um, but it's kind of silly. Don't, don't you agree? Of course, right? Uh, what should have happened? We should have just, uh, you know, played music. Why? Because music actually, as Rabbi Truman brings down, is one of the great mediums that brings us into the presence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And it also is a, as I mentioned earlier, there's a supernatural element to music as it relates to sacrifices. And when we offer up the sacrifice of praise, the sacrifice of Torah study, then we're offering up, as it were, a, a sacrifice, at least in the spirit realm. And therefore, we need the music. But what I really want to communicate to you now, it, Orthodox tradition, tr traditional Orthodox synagogues don't have music. It's been their tradition. They've been doing it for generations upon generations. People are used to it. They might think it's weird to have a musical instrument played on Shabbat. And I totally understand. And when I'm in those communities, I comply. Okay, because that's the right thing to do. In Lapid Judaism, however, we just look at halakha for what it is. And there is no halakhic prohibition to not to play music on shabbat there just isn't it doesn't exist so for us to impose a halakha that doesn't exist would be actually not good and that's our position and it's all based on on torah i want to bring this to your attention because this is one of those issues that you're likely to come up against so let's look at another insight here from from the Kale Tumash, it says, at God's bidding, they encamped. The Israelites never knew in advance how long they would be staying at any given camp. It could have been for a day or for years. Nevertheless, they would set up the tabernacle in its entirety at each encampment 
following God's instructions to keep the tabernacle functioning at all times. This teaches us two important lessons. First, we should recognize that it is God who leads us through all of our journeys in life, whether geographical, emotional, mental, or spiritual. Let me just let me just say right now that Bitcoin is very liberating. What is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is trust. Everybody likes to talk about having faith. I have faith in God. I have faith in the Torah. I have faith and faith and faith and faith. And that's great. Faith is great and it's very needed. However, the, the faith is faith is faith. I have faith that um, if I if I I have faith that if I take these supplements, they will in fact make me healthier. That's great. Uh, but faith doesn't actually get you to take the supplements. Bitcoin does. Bitcoin is faith in action. It's one thing to have, say you have faith. It's something entirely different to say you have Bitcoin. Bitcoin means that I just trust Hashem, that whatever I'm going through in this life, wherever I am in the journey, is because Hashem has me here. Therefore, I have nobody to blame. I don't have to worry about it. it's your fault. The reason I feel the way I feel is because, uh, because, or, or, or do, or, or this situation is because of this circumstance. Let me give you an example. And 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 we and by the way, you know, Rebbesin is fond of saying, um, you know, life is a test. Quoting Rebbesin Youngris. I've learned a lot about Bitcoin and how just to accept. Um, Roll, here's another way of saying it, roll with the punches. Now, this is not a quesara, sara attitude, which is different. This is an attitude that everything comes from Hashem. There must be a good reason. And, um, you know, you just, you just leave it up to God's hands. And it's very freeing. It's very liberating where you can and I don't mean this in a negative sense, but you can blame God. And if there's somebody in your life that's oppressing you or you feel oppressed, you just understand that that's an agent of an, an agent of a shim. And that oppression is, um, there must be a reason for it. It's trying to make you better, trying to make you stronger. It's a, it's a test. You know, recently, a couple of, couple of, two or three weeks ago, uh, Rebbe Sin and I, we noticed, I have, I have a, I have a, Do I have a Dodge Ram truck. It's a it's a 2012. It's a nice truck, Brukasham. And so it had a weird clicking noise in the engine. Click, 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 click. And uh sound like that like there was a bird stuck in the engine. So finally, I was like, you know what? I, I really need to take this to a place and get it checked out. What what is it's weird? Do I do I have a do I have a belt loose? Is there something is there is there something loose in here? What's going on? So I took it there. And <laughs> The truck, uh, it's got some miles on it, but it's not too bad, you know. And uh, the guy said, I got bad news. This particular engine, sometimes it can have a particular failure. Uh, you know, it's not exactly necessary. It's kind of kind of common, but, you know, also kind of rare. It's kind of, kind of one of those things. And um, you, you drew the short straw. I said, okay, what are you talking about here? What's it going to take to fix it? New engine. New engine. New engine. <laughs> you know, and I think that if you if you would have talked to me maybe three years ago, I would have been like, what? You know, you kind of like, how, why, when, where? But after walking through some things, you know, we walk, we all walk through things in life. You know, not things. Things are just, you know, things. But when you walk through to situations in your life that, you know, cause you to develop Bitcoin, that's when you walk through some things. OK, so I've, I've walked through some things in the last three years. And so when I got this news, I was like, ah, OK. Must be a reason why Shim wants me to have a new engine. Must be a reason why this has to be the case. So, OK. I'm not saying that I was like. Uh, popping the cork bottle on a champagne or anything, but uh, 
but I'm just saying you you learn to say it's a shim. Uh, okay, it's 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 an expense. I don't understand, but I'm gonna, you know, try to look on the bright side or try to learn the lesson, or maybe it's just a test. Maybe Hashem just wants to see how I'm gonna react. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna react in bit to go. This is just an example. So wherever we're going in life, we have to understand it's Hashem. Wherever we are on the geographical, emotional, mental, or spiritual, we focus on Hashem. And that's the point. When we focus on Hashem and make it a conversation between he and we, he and us, he and I, the king and I, then uh, we don't get sideways with everything and, and everyone and every every issue to our left and to our right, because we know it's all a shim. This is a test, and it's only a test. It says, we should indeed make our own plans based on our own life's goals, but at the same time, we must realize that God knows when it's in our best interest to stay put or move on to the next station in life, and that he arranges things accordingly. That's so true. And I, and I not to belabor our little story about the truck, but Robinson and I, you know, we were thinking about some things, you know, uh, about another vehicle, maybe getting a second vehicle and, and so forth. Uh, but this, that was our plan, but now the plan's kind of been pushed back, kind of changed. It's, 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 you know, it's just something she and I have been talking about, but it got shifted. So then we have to ask ourselves, okay, why is Shim want us to shift that plan? You know why? Because God cares about every aspect of our life, every single aspect. He cares. He cares about it. He, he, he cares about everything. He cares about the color you want to paint your house. He cares. You say, ah, oh, God doesn't care. He cares because he's intimately involved in every single aspect of your life. And so if he wants to change your plan, he just changes your plan. It's not, he's not being mean. He's just directing you towards the, the area he wants you. You say, well, what cosmic, what cosmic benefit or cosmic issue does it care, Rabbi, whether or not you and your wife have us get a, a different type of second vehicle or whatever? I don't know. I don't have the answer for you. All I know is that God cares. There's something about it that he cares about. But then again, it could be just a test. It could be just. And Shem says, okay, you've been through some things. Let's see how you do now with this. The thing is, when we give God the glory and when we say, okay, Baruch Hashem. Don't understand that, but I accept it and, and it's, it's great. You know, I, I accept it and we'll, I'll do the best we can. I'll put my trust in you. I'll, 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 I'll talk to you about it, Hashem, about how you want me to handle it. And as a result, what ends up happening is the trial you're going through will quickly disappear, like, like vapor. Because the ship's like, all right, great, you got the message. You're talking to me. Great, let's let's walk through this. I'll show you. Trial's gone. However, if we get our attention focused on something else or someone else or blah blah blah, which is not uncommon. Okay, you're you're not wicked or evil or or foolish for doing that. That's that's common human thing. Okay, but the problem is it will extend the trial because the whole purpose is for something else. Right. So just to wrap this up, it says, second, we should not put our lives on hold. OK, not we're not going to do that. Just waiting for God to direct us when we are in a temporary situation. So we need to just continue to live for God. Can, even if we're in a temporary situation, go ahead and erect the tabernacle. What's, what's what it's alluding to. Since God is beyond time and place, when we connect with him, even for one moment, that moment lasts for all time. That's something to think about, right? You say, like, well, well, I'm in this temporary situation. What should I do? Go ahead and erect your tabernacle and connect with God. Why? Because there's no time and space in God. So even if you connect with him for a moment, you've connected with, with him forever. If you say for our point of view, it's just for a moment. But his, from his point of view, there's no such thing as a moment. So make every connection you can, because every connection you make with Hashem is a connection for eternity. So it says, in, con in conclusion, whether a personal journey lasts for a decade or a day, we can make it into a sanctuary. We can imbue it with eternal permanence of God's presence. And that's the lesson brought down from 
this verse 23 at God's bidding they encamped and one final insight just as it relates back to the shofar or uh, blast if you go to war show blow the shofar allegorically the war we are constantly fighting is the war against our evil inclination that's your battle ladies and gentlemen the, this fight is particularly intense during prayer. Boy, isn't that true? Isn't it true that he, our minds are bombarded with foreign thoughts when we're just trying to pray? When the evil inclination tries to distract you the most is when we are praying. He doesn't want us to concentrate and thereby deepen our connection and relationship with Hashem. The allegorical trumpet we sound in order to enlist God's help against the evil connection is our heartbroken cry to him. The silent tears we shed over being so spiritually weak that we are vulnerable to the evil inclination strategy. When we beseech God to have mercy upon us, he comes to our aid and rescues us from our enemy. Nothing new in the New Testament. We say, well, who's going to who's going to save us from uh from the evil inclination, Messiah Yeshua. This has been true for all time. God saves us from the evil inclination. But we see here that we must blow the trumpets not only while in thick of battle, but also when we've overcome the enemy in our joyous festivals. Blowing the trumpets on the occasions remind us that our victory over the evil inclination is never final. We should never let our success get the better of us. Don't ever rest on your laurels. The evil inclination is always devising new ways to ensnare us, and we must be constantly on guard, constantly enlisting God's help and mercy. We Guys, you will never defeat, as it were, the evil inclination. You will always be at war with the evil inclination. Even when you have a victory in one area, he will come and start attacking you in another area. The sacrifices mentioned here reflect the two basic stages in how we approach God. The first stage is the ascent offering whose meat are, are burned up and totally consumed on the altar. First, we must submit our lives totally to God. The second stage is a peace offering, part of which whose meat is eaten by those who offer it. And we must, after we have established the basis for total submission to God, we can and should enhance our relationship with him. We have to give our lives to God and then we have to communicate. So we have to cry out to God in our battle. And we have to cry out to God in our success. And at that point, we are blowing the spiritual trumpets. End of our Aliyah today. Thank you so much for being a part of this. May Hashem help us to increase our trust in Him. And take every up and every down as part of His guidance. And may Hashem help us to glean from that. So thank you for being here. Please be sure and like this video. Comment on it. Share it with all of your friends. Subscribe to our channel. We're moving on to 11,000 subscribers now. We are, we are on our way with Hashem's help to 11,000 subscribers. May it be so. May we get there sooner rather than later. God bless all of you. Look forward to seeing you manana. Until then, have a great and amazing day.